classic Las Vegas stuff. It's got the mob, it's got murder, it's got uh, great characters. These people were total cold-blooded killers. Tom was uh, Benny's biggest hitman. This was the most sensational murder in the history of Las Vegas. Tom Hanley demanded money and told Bramlett to get into the van or they would kill him right here. It's about the murder of Al Bramlett, who was probably the most powerful labor leader in the history of Nevada. He was kidnapped. He was hauled out in the middle of nowhere. He was led down this hill down here. They put a gun to his head and they stuck him under this, uh, under these piles of rocks here, left his hands sticking out. Molding him into becoming a murderer, a hitman. He just had one fault, he had to kill. He did. Do you have the feeling that there are other bodies out here, I mean, in the same area? Oh, I, this, this was their favorite place of dumping areas. Like a person has to eat, Tom had to kill. Al Bramlett had a lot of enemies. In fact, that's really what our story is about, is who his true enemies were. George Knapp reports. The 1977 murder of labor leader Al Bramlett easily ranks as one of the most sensational and most important crimes in Las Vegas history. The men who committed the murder had clear and convincing ties to organized crime, and when they finally confessed to the slaying, law enforcement considered the case closed. That may have been premature. The true motive for the Bramlett murder may be even more sinister than what the public was led to believe, and the men behind it may have been responsible for a litany of other heinous crimes, crimes that remain unsolved to this day. Tonight, a re-examination of what really happened, why it happened, and who else was involved. It's a twisted tale that until now has not been told. Las Vegas in the mid-1970s was a town flexing its muscles and stretching its legs. The soundtrack of the day may have packed a disco beat, but Las Vegas, as always, listened to a somewhat different drummer. At UNLV, an outlaw coach, still sporting a few tufts of hair, led a team of talented rebels to the heights of college basketball. While the Vietnam War had ended in 1975, continuing world tensions meant ongoing atomic explosions at the Nevada test site. Thousands of test site workers pumped millions of dollars into the local economy. The city was growing and thriving, but was still small enough so that locals didn't need to sprinkle breadcrumbs to keep from getting lost at McCarran Airport. The gambling industry was far more modest than the mega resorts and fun for the whole family special attractions of today. Las Vegas was still a playground for adults. Binion's Horseshoe would take any wager a person wanted to gamble, no matter how large. At the Las Vegas Hilton, the king of rock and roll was still packing them in until his death in 1977. One-of-a-kind sporting events attracted the highest of high rollers. The mobsters who'd built the town kept it small, friendly, relatively crime-free, and immensely profitable. But change was in the air. The corporations were moving in, and the boys were moving out. At least that's what the Chamber of Commerce wanted the world to believe. The new order of things was represented by billionaire Howard Hughes, who, until his drug-addled demise in 1976, was the single largest landholder, taxpayer, and casino kingpin in the state. By buying up mafia-tainted gambling properties, it was said, Hughes had helped make Las Vegas more respectable. The, the town was just significantly different. Uh, it, it was going through, quite frankly, a change as well. Uh, uh, Hughes was uh, supposedly pushing out organized crime, and organized crime was going through its, its changes in the community. They, those guys were still here, though. They, they were still here, but, but in, a different, in a different role. They had more or less been moved out of the boardroom and onto the streets. In, in many cases, uh, they were involved in, in loan sharking and selling dope where in the past that they were, uh, uh, they kept a lot of that out because they were in the back room skimming off millions. The underworld figures who'd made millions in Las Vegas weren't going to leave it without a fight, no matter who was coming in. Organized crime is not welcome in. 
in Atlantic City. And I warn them again, keep your filthy hands out of Atlantic City. Keep the hell out of our state. I know I'd go from rags to riches. When gambling was legalized in Atlantic City in the mid-70s, the head of the powerful Chicago mob, Anthony Big Tuna Accardo, proposed a treaty of sorts with the New York mafia families. Chicago would stay out of New Jersey if New York would do the same in Nevada. Chicago and its Midwestern subsidiaries already had a substantial investment in Las Vegas. Through their influence with the Teamsters Pension Fund, they had arranged for millions of dollars in loans, loans that helped build nearly every casino on the strip, former federal prosecutor Larry Levitt. The mob's ability to control the, particularly the central state's pension fund of the Teamsters Union uh, created for them an enormous bank uh, which was able to bankroll the mob's interests wherever they went whether it's Las Vegas or elsewhere. The Dunes, for example, was one of the hotels that had accepted millions in union loans, not only from the Teamsters, but also from the International Culinary Union. Dunes owner, Maura Schenker, had once been the lawyer for Teamster boss Jimmy Hoffa, but denied any mob affiliations. Oh, there is no organized crime or any hidden interest in the Dunes Hotel. I'm willing to stake my life, my reputation, and, and everything I've got on that statement. Former Midwest bootlegger and illegal gambler Mo Dalitz, a one-time partner of Meyer Lansky and founder of a half dozen Las Vegas casinos, was still a civic fixture and casino landlord in the mid-70s. Such a beloved grandfatherly figure that he was honored as Las Vegas Man of the Year. Dalitz, too, was reluctant to talk about past associations. The allegations of organized crime ties. What do, you, what do you say to those people and those allegations after all these years? This interview was not supposed to touch on personalities or personal things. So I must ask you to forgive me for not answering you. Second only to Howard Hughes in the number of casinos owned was an obscure San Diego businessman, Alan R. Glick, who somehow finagled $100 million in Teamster loans and bought four Las Vegas properties, including the Stardust and Fremont hotels. Like Dalitz, Glick, too, was honored as Las Vegas Man of the Year, but his position came with a price. There's no such thing as a free lunch. When Alan Glick got his $67 million uh, pension fund loan from Central States, there were strings attached. One of those attached strings was Frank Lefty Rosenthal, a brilliant sports gambler with lifelong ties to assorted mafia figures. Keeping with the wishes of his silent partners, Glick appointed Rosenthal to run his casinos. Federal agencies estimate that during Rosenthal's management, up to $20 million was skimmed from Glick's casinos between 1974 and 1976 alone, with the stolen loot then funneled back to Midwestern mob bosses who had arranged Glick's Teamster loans in the first place. Las Vegas may have been changing, but some things remained the same. We see you growing more with the uh, with Argent Corporation taking uh, a higher position, possibly. That's a question for Mr. Glick. And Mr. Rosenthal is in as high a position as you can have now. And while Lefty Rosenthal was considered the mob's man on the inside, the one who kept it together on the outside was tough Tony Spilatro, regarded by lawmen as the Chicago mob's provincial governor in Las Vegas. Spilatro came to control local street rackets, loan sharking, fencing, but his primary job, law enforcement believed, was to do whatever was necessary to protect the flow of the skim. Tony the Ant was suspected in nearly two dozen murders and numerous other crimes, but always beat the rap, in part because of the nimble legal mind of his attorney, future Las Vegas mayor Oscar Goodman, who not coincidentally was also the lawyer for Spilatro's friend since boyhood, Lefty Rosenthal. How lucky can one guy be? That was the mix in the mid-70s, as Las Vegas poised on the brink of explosive growth to come. Cautious corporate bean counters slowly changing the face of the strip, brazen old-style mob associates still skimming from the till. And a man with one foot in each camp, union leader Al Bramlett, who had maintained an iron grip on the powerful culinary union for a quarter century. 
Bramlett had built local 226 into the second largest local in the country. With 20,000 members working in Nevada resorts, his power and influence were unparalleled. We're going out tonight at 8 o'clock. Are you prepared to stay out for the 30 days that is rumored that the Hughes Hotel properties will stay shut? To stay out whatever time is necessary. <laughs> In 1976, Bramlett led his union members in a bitter strike that shut down the Las Vegas Strip, erupted into violence, and led to numerous arrests. But this was a glaring exception. For the most part, during Bramlett's tenure, the culinary union peacefully coexisted with the mafia-controlled resorts. Years earlier, mob hitman turned government informant Jimmy the Weasel Fradiano bragged to federal agents that, for a large fee, Bramlett would use his political clout to help get gaming licenses for mob-connected operators. And former Teamster official Jackie Presser, who also turned FBI informant, told the feds that Bramlett was a partner in an ongoing kickback scheme in which the hotels paid for inflated insurance coverage, with the extra money being kicked back first to Bramlett and then on to his mob-connected partners in Chicago. Bramlett's rank-and-file members did well during his leadership, but Bramlett himself did even better. And there were suspicions in town at the time that he was living far beyond the means of his modest union salary. There was a sense that, uh, uh, that Bramlett worked as much for the, the hotels as he did for the members of the culinary union, um, and, and that he would receive uh, uh, payments from, from, from the hotels. None of that was actually ever approved because none of it ever, ever came, it came to trial. But he lived uh, uh, very well. Bramlett's lavish lifestyle would become all too apparent in the months after his murder when Las Vegas TV viewers saw ads for his estate auction. Bombay chest, several paintings, including four by world-famous French contemporary artist Charles Lavier. While Bramlett maintained relative peace with the casinos, he went to war with several independent restaurants when they tried to pull out of their agreements with culinary. Picket lines were set up at the restaurants. Fights and arrests were common. And when those tactics failed, Bramlett secretly set into motion a strategy that would lead directly to his own murder. Someone started planting bombs inside the offending restaurants. Whoever it was knew what he was doing. The two major bombings that I know directly of, uh, they lifted the roof off that place. They knew exactly where to plant each charge so that it wouldn't affect any buildings or anyone near, nearby. They went straight up and straight down. There's a rest home by one of those restaurants, and I don't even think it woke up the old birds in there. <laughs> they, were, they were dangerous people. They really were. But who were they? The shocking headlines about restaurant bombings continued for two years. In each instance, the targeted business had been in a fight with the culinary union. Even with the finger of suspicion pointed directly at the union, investigators couldn't make the case. The always cagey Bramlett largely succeeded in avoiding direct questions from reporters of the day. Al was very bright, a personable guy, and the media was able to talk to him on occasion within, within the confines of, of what he wanted to be uh, asked questions about. Um, uh, you, you, were, you just didn't call up and say, I'd like to talk to you, Al, and he'd say, come on over. Um, uh, you'd have to work on that. And, and, uh, and, and more often than not, you wouldn't be able to get it. Bramlett had already told the police he knew nothing about the bombings. He finally agreed to tell the public. His interview with Channel 8's Bill McCarty turned out to be his last. What is your greatest fear that might happen because of the, the two devices that were found at the two restaurants? I don't quite uh, understand what you mean. What's my greatest fear? Uh, how do you see this as it reflects upon the union? Uh, certainly a circumstantial finger has been pointed at the union because of the labor difficulties with the two restaurants. Do you have any fear that it will reflect adversely on the union or that if police do find a suspect that it will be a member of this union? No, I do not think so in any way that it will be a member of this local union. Because as you know, this local union does not condone such activities. We've been here a long time. We've had none of these incidents. There's been a couple of incidents before that they've tried to lay to steps of this union. But you and I both know it is not true. We have not been a local union that has pulled these tactics. And after all, our people were on the outside. And if anybody got hurt, our people would have got hurt also. Do you have any thoughts on who may be responsible? Well, whoever's responsible is to make this union look bad. 
Were you doing any investigating on your own within the Union personnel? As far as investigating by the Union, I think that's a policeman's job. And I'm not a policeman. I'm willing to cooperate with the police department in any way that they see it fit to ask me to. But what Bramlett didn't do is provide the police with the names of those he had hired, Tom and Granby Hanley, father and son, an assassination team suspected of not only planting bombs for the Union, but also of committing murders for hire on behalf of mobsters and others. Coming up, the woman who shared a bed with one of the hitmen lived with the other and the only person still alive to know their secrets. Do you have the feeling that there are other bodies out here, I mean, in the same area? Oh, I, this, this was their favorite place of dumping areas and up further toward Pahrump and mine shafts. There's so many, it's unbelievable. George Knapp reports in the company of killers will return after these messages. We have checked with a number of persons who uh, were closely associated with Mr. Bramlett. Uh, we have been un unable to come up with uh, any reason as to his disappearance. On February 24, 1977, Nevada's most influential labor leader vanished. Al Bramlett had arrived at McCarran Airport after a flight from Reno. He telephoned his daughter and told her he'd be home in half an hour, but he never showed. The circumstances were immediately deemed suspicious. His car was in the parking lot out there, and uh, it was found, which leads us to believe that he never even got to his car. The disappearance generated a palpable shudder along the strip and through Nevada's other corridors of power, almost as if a governor or elected official had been snatched. I understand a reward has been issued. Yes, sir. We are uh, offering a $25,000 reward for leading to the information of the whereabouts of Mr. Bramlett. I hope and we are praying that he will return. I felt someone was seriously wrong. Jim Arnold is the current head of the Culinary Union. Back then, he was a young business agent hired by Al Bramlett himself. Rank and file members were shocked by the disappearance because Bramlett was their hero, despite stories about his accumulated wealth. He remembers that day and time when we didn't know much. Uh, we heard rumors. Uh, I'll never forget, I used to read Ned Day's column just to find out what was going on. Uh, so no, we didn't, uh, but you know, he, he was there for us, he did a good job. We kind of felt that he looked over all of us. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a big blow to a lot of people. The disappearance, it was a shock. Day one, all kinds of rumors. He ran off to South America with millions of dollars. Day two, the buzz started at the beginning that there was foul play, uh, that there was foul play in Lake Tahoe, that he was buried in Lake Tahoe. Uh, that he was buried in Arizona. All kinds of stories were, were, were surfacing. Homicide detectives confirmed early on that Bramlett had made a second phone call on the 24th, this one from a pay phone at Mountain Springs, east of Las Vegas. The call went to an executive at the Dunes Hotel, requesting that $10,000 be delivered to Binion's Horseshoe, where someone would pick it up, explaining only that it was a personal matter. The arrangements were made, but no one came for the 10 grand. Investigators started assuming the worst. If we were kidnapping for ransom, yes, we would have probably received a demand. The other alternative would probably be a homicide. A massive search was launched. Men and machines scoured the desert in vain. Hot leads always seemed to dissolve into false hopes. But 10 days after the kidnapping, something changed. Somehow, police knew that Bramlett had been taken at gunpoint from the airport and thrown into the back of a blue van, that he'd been driven into the desert, possibly to Red Rock Canyon, where he'd been stripped naked, then shot several times. Details made their way into news reports. And told Bramlett to get into the van or they would kill him right here. It was apparent the police had a witness. As Al Bramlett sat in the back of that van, a gun pointed in his direction, he must have wondered what fate awaited him. If not for the presence of a surprise witness, someone else along for the ride, chances are police would never have found Bramlett's body. As the media soon learned, the witness was hard-drinking Eugene Vaughn, who told police he had reluctantly accompanied Bramlett's killers as they snatched the union boss from the airport, then drove him into the desert where he was murdered. Vaughn passed two polygraph tests, but was unable to help police find the body. 
That part of the mystery ended when two hikers spotted a human hand sticking out of a pile of rocks in the desert just west of Mount Potosi. The search for Al Bramlett has ended here in the desert just two weeks from the night he disappeared. According to Eugene Vaughn, the men responsible for the murder were Tom Hanley and his son, Andrew Gramby Hanley, names well known to police and to union officials. A multi-state dragnet was initiated, although no one could say where the Hanleys might be hiding. It probably wasn't much of a surprise that Tom Hanley might be involved in the murder of a union official. Hanley had been active in the Las Vegas labor scene since the 40s, was an official of the Sheet Metal Workers Union, even served on the Central Labor Council. In the days when Las Vegas was still a roadside burg, having control of a union meant real power. You couldn't build a shed in this town without getting it cleared through that way. Ralph Alsop Jr. should know his father was also a union official and worked closely with Tom Hanley, so close that police believe the two men murdered another union leader, James Hartley, in 1954. Hartley and Hanley both worked for the sheet metal local. When Hartley was shot in the head, Hanley was a prime suspect. Alsop says his father confessed to helping Hanley with the murder. Yes, in our small bathroom. They shot him in the bathroom, in the bathtub, so the blood would drain to the tub. And then they took him out into the back 40 and buried in the back 40. We had 20 acres out there. So they buried him in your backyard? Yeah. Is that where the body was found? That's, where the, that's where the body was found. Dogs dug up his hand. That's how they actually found it. They found a hand. Your father helped Tom Hanley kill Hartley? Uh, was he part of it? Let's say he may have been involved. Police found the murder weapon in the possession of one of Tom Hanley's union cronies. A third accomplice, the man who bought the gun for Hanley, was also murdered before he could talk. Officially, the Hartley murder was never solved. But Detective Dave Hatch, who works the cold case files for Metro, is certain that Hanley did the job, and many more besides. James Hartley was the first one in 1954, labor leader. labor leader. They killed him and took his car down to L.A. and parked it across the street from a labor union place to send a message to whoever else they were upset with. Upset or not, murder suspect Tom Hanley brazenly served as a pallbearer for the slain Hartley. Dave Hatch doesn't think Hartley was an isolated victim. His review of unsolved murder cases turned up several homicides that seemed to point to Tom Hanley, his son Gramby, or both. I reviewed uh, cases from 1943 to 1982 so far, and I've identified, or they were identified by the investigators in seven homicides that we knew of, in, just within our jurisdiction. These people were total cold-blooded killers. The, if there was enough money in it, or if they suspected somebody of being an informant or something, they'd just kill them right on the spot. They were, uh, they were probably two of the most active contract murderers in, in, the Western, in the Western states history, I'm sure. In the early days, when we were having union wars here, in the late 50s, 60s, and even into the early 70s, they were up for hire, they were enforcers. Despite police suspicions, though, Tom and Gramby Hanley were convicted of only one murder, that of Al Bramlett. The difficulty in nailing the elder Hanley was that witnesses against him had a bad habit of dying. Ralph Alsop, for example. The Alsop and Hanley families were close for decades. Alsop Jr. has childhood photos of he and his brother having ice cream with the Hanley sisters. And Alsop Sr. was suspected of helping Tom Hanley murder James Hartley. In 1966, Alsop himself was murdered on his front porch with a shotgun blast. Police were certain Tom Hanley had ordered the hit. Hanley was arrested and spent more than a year in jail awaiting trial. But the charges were dismissed because two key witnesses against him both were murdered. Ralph Alsop Jr. loaded up two pistols and went to the Hanley home on Ogden Street looking for justice. I emptied one pistol thinking he might come out thinking it was empty and still had another one waiting for him. Yeah, I was determined to kill Tom Hanley. The attempt failed. Somehow, violence seemed to follow the Hanleys. The family was marred by several tragic deaths. Tom was jailed many times for assault on an IRS agent, for shooting two men who came to his home, for pulling a gun on two guys who were flirting with his attractive common-law wife, Wendy, 40 years younger than he. 
now that I get older and look back, I mean, he was a control freak, and the only way that he felt that he could get gain that control is through violence. Can't look at anybody else. Right. Oh, yes. He, he threatened my life a couple of times. What did he say? Um, he said, if you look at another man, I will take a gun, and, and he went like this and put it up to my temple, and... Pfft. You believed him? Yes, I did, because uh, there was one incident uh, right after Amy was born, that's our daughter, she was one month old, and we were at a Safeway store shopping, and these two guys that were standing in front of me said something to me, and I was laughing with them, and the next thing I knew, he pulled out a gun in the store and was threatening to kill them. When police came to the Ogden house to arrest Hanley, they found an arsenal. Finally, my attorneys told me they'd already arrested Tom, and they came in and they took out 56 guns. Wendy says she came to know intimate details about the father and son hitman team, who they killed, and who paid for the contracts. She lived through the Al Bramlett ordeal, was arrested for trying to spring her husband from jail, and may have been groomed by Tom to be an assassin herself. But how does such a young woman end up living with two killers? What role did the late Ted Binion play in this drama? And why wasn't she killed, considering all that she knows? In a sense, I've been left alive this long to tell this story. And I think there's a lot of um, souls out there that Tom and Granby uh, killed. And I think there needs to be a lot of closure.